Well, this morning, last week, we looked at the lineage of Christ, the genealogy. This week, we look at the birth of Christ. You know, really, the focal point of the Bible is the Gospels. This 33-year span of Christ's life and ministry, all of the Scripture really just looks towards that moment. And really, it's bigger than just the Bible. That life of Christ is uh, really the, the watershed moment of all of human history. All of human history is divided into two parts, and the focal point, that watershed moment, is Jesus. The secularists, the atheists, they can try to ignore him. They can try to rename it CE or whatever, BCE. They can try to throw it out, but the reality is Jesus splits history in two. He is the focal point, the watershed moment. And within the Gospels is a thought, a reality that is so glorious. It's really more than we can comprehend. It's bigger than we can grasp in our finite human minds. And it's the incarnation of Christ. It's God himself putting on flesh and dwelling among us. It's perfect humanity unblemished deity united in one person, Jesus, forever. It's the incarnation, the celebration of Christmas. And there's really no more glorious thought. You see, every other religion in the world hands you a list of things you need to do. Every other religion in the world whether it be that you meditate your way into enlightenment or you perform religious activities and duties to somehow get to God and get to heaven. Every other religion in the world, it's all about you. Your goodness, your righteousness, what you can do. Christianity begins by telling you that you're not good. (laughs) That's why the gospel really is so offensive because we want everything to be about us. We want somebody to just tell us, you're good. The reality is you're not. Don't believe what your mama told you. You're not a good boy, all right? At your core, you are a sinner. You are broken. But what makes Christianity so glorious is the knowledge that you couldn't get to God. You're far too sinful. He's too too holy. So what he did is he came to us. He came, did what you couldn't, died the death you should have, overcame the grave. He came for you so that you could have life. And it really hits what I believe to be the deepest longings of man. That man longs to know that somebody cares for him. There's something in us that just longs to know that there's somebody out there really big that cares for us. If you don't have somebody in your life that cares for you, life's just bad. We long to know that somebody cares for us. Somebody loves us. Somebody's coming for us. Somebody's going to save us. We write it into every other story that we know of. In fact, um, this weekend, uh, me and the family, Faith and the boys, we went to see the new Star Wars movie. How many went to see Star Wars? There's a, some of you are afraid to admit it this morning. <laughs> I'm here. I'm not really a movie goer. We're not really Star Wars. People, Faith said, I got to dress up like Darth Vader. I said, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not. It's crazy. No, we didn't. No. If you know my wife, that would embarrass her that I even mention that. <laughs> so we went. But you know what's crazy? This story. Here it is. This divine figure, this Luke Skywalker is going to come back and he's going to save the day and he's indestructible and he can't be beaten and he wins the day. And there's this moment where everybody in the theater applauds. And to me, it was a little bit irritating because I want to say this person has come. It's real, it's true, it's historical, it's biblical, it's Jesus. And Matthew and Luke record it for us that there is someone who is truly divine. He's a virgin born. He came for you and he died for you and he won the day and he gives us the victory. That is the story. 
I wanted to scream in the theater. You, want to, you think that's cool. Let me tell you what's really cool. To me, it's why, it's why atheism and agnosticism and even evolution, they're, they're dangerous. Because at the core of those philosophies is that there is no creator. Therefore, your life has no meaning and you have no value. John Paul Sartre, great atheist philosopher, said that life is an empty bubble floating on a sea of nothingness. Doesn't that just get you fired up to live this morning? You know? <laughs> Even he said that that philosophy of life, on his deathbed, he rejected it. He said it's abs- it, it, it only leads to despair. See, everything, every other religion, you do this, you do that, and you can't get there, and you only wind up in despair. The Bible Christianity brings hope that somebody does love you. Somebody has come for you. It's the virgin-born son of God, Jesus. And the birth narrative really, it needs little explanation. In fact, in as much as we get involved in explanation, sometimes we get in over our heads because it's so sublime and so glorious. Most commentators, they almost apologize for commenting on it because it's really just intended to be read, to just sit back and enjoy this glorious thought that's so high, you can't get your mind around it. But at the end of the day is the simple message that God loves you. So let's, let's just enjoy it this morning. Let's read it together. Would you stand with me this morning in the honor of reading God's word? Matthew 1, let's, let's begin in verse 18. We'll read down through verse 25. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Let's pray together. God, as we come before this story that for most of us is so familiar, we just read right over it and we miss the divine. And God, I pray that we'd have opportunity just to slow down for these few brief moments and again ponder the wonder of God with us. God, overwhelm us again with your love and your mercy that was so beautifully demonstrated to us in a baby born in a manger. Come for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want us to look at the characters of this story and identify the qualities that made them great. The first thing that I want us to see is that Mary is faithful. Mary is faithful. If you look in verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. So Mary and Joseph are betrothed. What does it mean to be betrothed? Well, uh, during this betrothal period, you were in fact legally married. You were bound to one another. If you, if you were to break off a betrothal period, you had to give a certificate of divorce. So we oftentimes want to compare this to engagement, but really very different than engagement as we know it. You were legally married in every way except one. You didn't live together and you weren't together or you didn't sleep together during that period. During that one year, it was a one year period. And the purpose of this was so that during that one year period, you um, really proved out the purity of the bride. That if she was pregnant prior to the betrothal or, or that occurred during the midst of it, it would be proved out during the course of that year. And so here is Mary and Joseph in this legal obligation, legally married, 
in a time in which you're proving out Mary's purity. And when you understand that situation, it really makes what is said in verse 18, at the latter portion of verse 18, stick out like a sore thumb. Because essentially what is said here is that Mary and Joseph were betrothed, and yet she was pregnant. And that's not supposed to fit together. <laughs> that's not the way it's supposed to be. That's supposed to catch our eyes and say, uh-oh, <laughs> something's wrong here. And so Matthew adds that simple phrase at the very end of verse 18, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Matthew is um, letting us in on the fact that something supernatural is happening here. Uh, Joseph won't get the memo till later. But right here, Matthew wants you to know a couple of things very clearly. He wants you to understand that Mary, number one, is a virgin. Mary has not been with a man. Now, Mary herself declares this. You've got to remember that Matthew speaks from the perspective of Joseph, while Luke speaks from the perspective of Mary primarily. But in Luke, Mary will say, when the angel confronts her with what's about to happen, Mary will say in Luke 134, how can this be since I am a virgin? So she declares it. Joseph declares it because as we're going to see in the following verses, he lets everybody know, I, whoever's child this is, it isn't mine. And later he will declare that Mary is a virgin and this is the son of God. So Mary and Joseph, the, the angel Gabriel declares it. In Luke 1, 37, 38, the angel will declare to Mary when she says, how is this going to happen? The angel will declare, nothing is impossible with God. A man and woman conceiving a child is not only possible, it is probable. And it happens all the time. A virgin born child is impossible. That is something only God can do. So when you look at this, you've got these individuals, Mary, Joseph, God, Gabriel, Matthew, and Luke, all declare that Mary is a virgin. These are what you call primary sources, meaning these are people who have the most knowledge of this situation and all of them unequivocally declare that Mary has never been with a man. So Matthew wants us to see that, but he also wants us to understand that this child, the only explanation for the conception of this child is that Mary has been overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. This child is a product of God. Now, you say, why is this important? Folks, this is absolutely critical. If Jesus is simply a product of Joseph and Mary, if this is Joseph and Mary's child, then he has been born in iniquity and conceived in sin, meaning he's just like you and me. And therefore, he is disqualified and cannot atone for the sins of man. But the Bible goes overboard to show us that Jesus is not just a man. He is the virgin-born Son of God. So Scripture declares to us, Mary's faithful. She's faithful to God, she is faithful to her husband, and this child is conceived because the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. Now, ladies, put yourself in Mary's shoes for just a moment. How would you like to go home and explain to your family and your relatives and your friends that I'm about to have a child, but I've never been with a man? How would you like to explain that to your fiance? Knowing that if a betrothed woman committed adultery, the punishment was that she was stoned. Meaning she could die. 
depending on how Joseph responds in this situation, she could end up stoned to death. How would you respond? How would you explain that? Would you go to to people and say, "I, I have conceived by the Holy Spirit? You have no Old Testament precedent. This has never happened before. You have barren women in the Old Testament that conceive, but they conceive by normal means. You have no Old Testament precedent. How would you have responded? Well, Luke tells us how Mary responded to this news probably overwhelmed with this situation, but Luke tells us exactly how Mary responds. He says in Luke 138, when Gabriel says to her, you're gonna conceive by the Holy Spirit, Mary responds and says, behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. That's faith. God hears my life. Now we we think automatically, what a great privilege to to give birth to God's Messiah. Folks, think of her situation. And she responds and says, my life is Lord, take it. Let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. I offer my life as a living sacrifice. Her response is essentially, I'm going to trust you, and if I die, I die. Do you know what I immediately thought of? Esther. I'm going to be faithful, and if I perish, I perish. But I'm going to trust you. Folks, that is faith. To say to God, I don't know what you're doing, I don't know what you're up to, and I have no idea how you're going to accomplish this deal, but I'm yours. Anybody going through a situation like that today, God, I don't know what you're up to. I don't know what you're doing, and I don't know how you're going to accomplish it, but here's my life. Take it. You're a bond slave. Let it be done to me according to your word. That's faith. Mary is faithful. Secondly, we see in this text that Joseph is righteous. Look in verse 19. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Now, guys, put yourself in Joseph's shoes for a moment. Your betrothed wife that you've never been with comes and tells you that she is pregnant. You gonna believe her? Sure, you've conceived by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, right. What's your response gonna be? Probably a little bit of anger. Probably initially, she's been unfaithful. Probably frustration. Probably some humiliation. Can you imagine guys going home and telling your parents, you know that girl I'm engaged to? She's pregnant. Is it yours? Nope, not mine. How would you like to explain that deal to your folks? The reality is Joseph is in a no-win situation. And he's really got one of two options. He can privately divorce her or he can publicly disgrace her. And if Joseph was simply looking out for what was in his own best interest, he would have had a publicly disgraced. Because what he would have done in that situation is he would have said, she has committed adultery, take her out and stone her. And what it would have done is declared to the world, I did nothing wrong, she is the sinner, you kill her. And thereby, he publicly acquits himself. But what does it tell us? It tells us that Joseph was a righteous man. And so he sought to send her away secretly, meaning this. You know, oftentimes when we think about what does it mean to be righteous, we think of somebody who keeps the word of God, follows the rules, does what is right all the time. And yes, that is the righteousness of God. But what scripture tells us in this instance is that Joseph is righteous 
because he desires to send her away secretly. Meaning what made Joseph righteous in this instance was not just that he wanted to follow the rules and do what was right, but that he had a heart of compassion and mercy and tenderness and kindness. Essentially, I know what I got to do, but I love this woman and I don't want to hurt her. Folks, this should be a good reminder to us because I think oftentimes we tend to one of the extremes. We think the righteousness of God, I got to stand on the rules. I'm going to do what's right. Who cares how I hurt somebody? But this is what I'm going to do. And there's people out there like that. I don't care if I hurt somebody. I'm going to do what's right. And this passage reminds us that's not true righteousness. True righteousness is the person who says, God, I desire to keep your word and follow your will. But I also have a heart of tenderness and compassion and love. So here's Joseph. I know what I got to do, but I don't want to hurt her. And as he's considering this, an angel of the Lord shows up to him. And in verse 20, that angel shows up to Joseph and the angel says to Joseph, Joseph, son of David. Now, this is interesting. The angel uses Joseph's title son of David and I think partly to remind us of the connection of the lineage the royal line of lineage for Jesus but there's also a point here that we don't need to miss Joseph has a legal right to the throne of Israel do you understand this Joseph in a different day had it not been for the sinfulness of his ancestors he would have been king And yet, because of the sinfulness of his ancestors, he's serving as a lowly carpenter in Nazareth. This would be like a guy who is in the royal line to become president, and he's serving as a plumber in Poto, Oklahoma. It's just not, it's not right. You look at this guy and you say, here he is of royal lineage, of, of royal descent, and yet he's serving as a carpenter in Nazareth? And this is why I admire Joseph so much that while he should have been king, he's simply serving faithfully in Nazareth, doing what God told him to do. And does God know where he's at? Oh, God knows where he's at. And he's going to use him in a mighty way. Isn't that humility? Some of you today are in a position you say, I shouldn't be treated this way. I should be this person or that. And God's got you in a different position. Can I tell you, God knows where you're at. You just be faithful. So here is Joseph, and, and the angel comes and says, Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit and she'll bear a son and you shall name, call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. So Joseph is kind of consoled by this angel. He's revealed to him that he, this child is conceived by the Holy Spirit and then you look, look at his response in verse 24. Jump down to verse 24. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. So, so here is Joseph. He awakes probably startled, probably a little humbled by this situation. But what's his response? Just faithful obedience. He doesn't question God. He doesn't say, hey, angel, how about I sleep on this one more night and then we'll figure this deal. And maybe I ate some bad pizza or something or whatever they ate. But may I, maybe just got some bad food here. But Joseph just obeys. In fact, he will, he will the scripture's clear. He names the child Jesus. Now, whenever a Jewish father named the son he was legally adopting that child as his. Joseph is saying, that child, I'm going to take him and raise him as if he's mine because God has spoken to me in his word and I'm going to take God his word. I'm going to trust him. Folks, do you see these two young individuals? Mary and Joseph just 
both of them seeking to trust God, even when all they have is a word from God. They're just going to take him at his word and they're going to trust him. Do you know what this reminded me of? You take two individuals who truly trust God and take him at his word and there's no limit to what God can do. There's no limit to what God can do when you take two individuals who will simply trust God and take him at his word. Mary is faithful. Joseph is righteous. He's going to trust God. Then thirdly, we see not only is Mary faithful, Joseph righteous, but Jesus is our Savior. Look back at verse 21. She'll bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for his save, he'll save his people from their sins. The Aramaic name Jesus comes from Hosea, Isaiah, Joshua, and they all say the same thing. God is our salvation. Hosea, prophet to the northern kingdom, what was his message? God is our salvation. Isaiah, prophet to the southern kingdom, what was his message? God hasn't forgotten you. He's going to send a suffering servant who will be your savior. God is our salvation. Joshua takes the people in the promised land. What was his message? We can't do it on our own. God is our salvation. So this name, the, the takeoff of all those Old Testament names, always means the same thing. Man does not have the ability to save himself. The only hope for deliverance and salvation is God. God must do it. He is our Savior. If you were to stand before God today and he were to ask you, why should I allow you into my kingdom? If you begin to give God your moral resume of all the good things that you have done, then you don't understand why Jesus came. Because listen, Jesus didn't come to be an educator. He didn't come to be a solicitor. He didn't come to be a doctor. He didn't come to be a rehabilitator. He came to be your savior. He came to save you from your sins. You know, later the Jews are going to reject Jesus. Why? Because he didn't come to do what they wanted him to do. They didn't want what they needed the most. What they wanted is somebody to save them from the Romans. They wanted a political leader. They wanted an, a guy who could save them from their, their sorry economy. They wanted somebody who could be a great politician and lead them out from under the Romans. But Jesus didn't come to be a great military leader. He didn't come to be a politician. He came to die for their sins. But you know, if you're gonna receive a savior, you've gotta first admit you're a sinner. See, if you're here this morning and you think you're doing all right on your own, you think you got it all, all your bases covered and you're going to somehow make it on your own righteousness. Can I tell you, we, we, we can't help you. But if you're here this morning, you'd be willing to say, I am a broke sinner. And I can't save myself. Boy, do we have a savior for you. And his name is Jesus. And he came to solve the greatest problem you have. And that is your sin. He is our Savior. Not only is Jesus our Savior, but Scripture is fulfilled. Look at verses 22 through 23. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. So Matthew quotes Isaiah 7:14. Now, Israel didn't initially view that verse as prophecy. They did later as they looked back upon it, or we do later as we look back upon it. It is um, an Old Testament promise with a New Testament fulfillment. It's a typology. That is the Old Testament symbol, New Testament. Jesus is the substance. But the context of that Old Testament story in Isaiah 7, 14 is that Israel was under a wicked king named King Ahaz. And he was in a bad spot because the king of Israel and the king of Aram had aligned themselves together and they were coming down to destroy Judah and to destroy Jerusalem. They were gonna wipe them out. 
And God sends Isaiah to go speak to King Ahaz. And King Ahaz, he didn't want to trust God. He just wanted to trust the Assyrians. Let's go get the Assyrians to help us out. And Isaiah goes to King Ahaz and tells him, don't you worry about these two little kings and their army. He, he, God calls them stubs. That's what people are to God, little stubs. They're little gerbils. They're little mocking parrots. They don't mean anything to him. God says to King Ahaz, if you trust me, you got nothing to worry about. You won't trust me, you don't have a prayer. And God says to King Ahaz, ask a miracle of me. Any miracle you want to see. Now Ahaz doesn't want to trust God, so he comes up with a very pious answer. And he says, no, I don't want to put God to the test. And Isaiah says, quit bugging me, and you're bugging God too. Ask something but he won't trust God. And so Isaiah says, God's going to make you a promise. God is going to show you something that you've never seen before. A virgin is going to conceive and give birth to a son, and they're going to name him Emmanuel, God with us. Now, there's a lot of debate amongst Old Testament scholars as to whether or not this had a partial fulfillment in the Old Testament and it had a full fulfillment in the New Testament. Can I be real honest with you? I think a lot of that doesn't matter. Here's what matters. We do know that the ultimate fulfillment is found in Jesus Christ. Now, here's what ought to blow your socks off. 700 years before Christ came. God promised he would come with specificity, told us that he would be born of a virgin and his name would be Emmanuel, which translated God with us. Folks, the Bible has many ways in which it proves that it is true. But one of the greatest ways it proves that it's true is its ability to speak about the future as if it's already happened. Did you know this today that 40% of your Bible is prophecy? That it speaks, 40% of your Bible is speaking about things before they ever happen. It's almost as if God's, like he likes to show off that I know the end before the beginning. This is amazing. But here's the take home for you and I today. Here's what you need to take home with you. If God makes a promise, even if it's a 700-year-old promise, know this, he always keeps his promises. So when Jesus says to us, I'm going to go away and prepare a place for you, and I'm going to come back again to receive you to myself, that where I am, you may also be. When he makes us that promise, you can write it down and take it to the bank that Jesus is coming for you. When God says, I will never leave you or forsake you, I don't care how lonely you feel today if you know Jesus Christ, you are never, ever alone. When Jesus says one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, can I tell you, there's a lot of people who don't want to bow and won't bow presently, but I'll tell you this, one day they're going to bow because Jesus said it. And when God declares that one day he's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes and there'll be no more mourning, there'll be no more crying or pain, the old things will pass away and he's going to make all things new, you can write it down and take it to the bank. Folks, God is faithful. Now one last point, and it's my favorite. In this promise, God gives what is my favorite title for Jesus. That he is Emmanuel. He's God with us. Folks, think about this. God is sovereign. He is more powerful than we can possibly comprehend. He spoke everything that we see into existence. He is all powerful. He is all knowing. He is holy. He is completely set apart. But know this today. He is not distant. 
This is not a God who created the world and then spun it into existence and then walked away from it, as the deists want to tell us. He is a God who is with us. So that today, listen to this, that today, if you would place your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you could have your sins forgiven. You could be a part of the greatest gift exchange ever known to man. You give God your sin and he'll give you his righteousness. You talk about a good trade. You could have your eternal destination secured. And folks, God himself will come to dwell in your heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. God himself would be so close to you that he would dwell within you. Folks, God is infinite. Whenever you divide infinity by anything, what do you always get? You always get infinity. It's not like he's given a little bit to Pastor Kent, a little bit to Pastor Bill, and a little bit to me. No, God himself. I heard a quote this week that I really liked. Why does God whisper to us? To remind us that he is close. Folks, isn't that good that he's close? Folks, if you don't hear anything else today, hear this. There is somebody who loves you. He made you. He sent his son who gave up the glory of heaven, put on the filth of humanity, lived a perfect life, and died on the cross for your sins so that you could have a relationship with God and so that you could know today you will never, ever be alone. Emmanuel, God with us. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that you are Emmanuel, God with us. You're not distant or removed from your creation, but you came. And God, if there's anybody here this morning that doesn't know you, that's never placed their faith in you for, for salvation, never trusted in you with all their heart, never given you their life, never submitted their life to you, God, I pray today that you would reveal to them the reality that all of us must face at some point, and that's that we're a sinner. If we compare ourselves to other people, somehow we might be able to make ourselves look good. But we know that your judgment is not about lining us and comparing us to each other. It's about comparing us to your holiness and to your law. And in light of your holiness, our response will be the same as Isaiah when he was confronted with your holiness. Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people. God, overwhelm us with your holiness this morning. That in your presence we are sinners and we are broken. And our only hope is that you would come for us. And that hope has been realized in Jesus who did come. And God, I pray that if somebody here doesn't know you, God, I pray they don't know the joy, the peace of walking in fellowship with you through faith in Christ. Draw them to yourself. Overwhelm them by your love. Peel back the blinders from their eyes that they might see the glory of Jesus, their Savior. And I pray they would trust you. Like Mary and Joseph, we know that today we walk by faith and not by sight. But God, I pray today that they would trust, they would take you at your word, and they would know and they would experience the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of your love that has been demonstrated in Christ. God, for those of us that do know you, I pray, God, we would never get over the fact that you love us and that you are Emmanuel, that no matter where we're at today, no matter how lonely we might feel, the reality is on the basis of your word, you are with us. We might turn away from you, you never turn away from us. You're not distant, you're close. Let us walk in fellowship with you. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. At this time, I'm gonna invite you to stand with me as we give you an opportunity to respond in whatever way God might be leading on your heart. Maybe you have questions about salvation. 
how you can know Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior. There'll be pastors here at the front who would love to receive you. Maybe you'd like to pray with somebody. Maybe you got something going on in your life right now. you just like to, to have a pastor pray with you. These pastors who will be here at the front. Maybe you'd like to unite with our church family to become a member of Lenexa Baptist. Whatever God is leading you to do today, know this, you'll never regret obeying Jesus. You respond as we sing together.